All right, well, thank you for inviting me today. This is uh, my attempt to do a quick, uh, fast and furious overview of some bone and soft tissue pathology for aimed at orthopedic surgery residents. Um, I understand you guys have some of this stuff on your uh, in-service and your boards. So I've tried to do my best to cover some of the, the major entities and things that I think you should know, but at a level that's hopefully not too in-depth or um, uh, too focused on the nerdy pathology stuff of it. Uh, feel free to stop and interrupt me with questions. I can always edit that out of the video later. Unless you like how you get it right and then you look awesome and then I'll leave it in so that you can, you know, get some street cred. So um, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate all laughs, even pity laughs. That's fine. And um, yeah, so I don't know. There's just so much stuff to cover, but I'll do my best to cover as many things as I think I can uh, in an hour. All right. The first thing is this is bone, right? This is bone histology. And if you go way back to med school and think about this, I know you guys have studied it since then, but being able to recognize bone and cartilage and some basic soft tissue components under the microscope um, is a useful feature for soft tissue pathologists. I, uh, on my YouTube channel, I have tons of videos about bone and soft tissue tumors, some um, esoteric, some very in depth, but it may be useful to you. I do have a particularly good video on bone histology and embryology and another one on cartilage histology and embryology. And they are not by me, they're by uh, Dr. Andrew Rosenberg, who's a fantastic bone pathologist at University of Miami. And he came and visited uh, me at uh, University of Arkansas in my old job. And uh, very nice, agreed to sit down at the scope with me for an afternoon and just uh, teach. And I recorded all of it and it was just fantastic stuff. So for bone, bone is pink usually, right? It's pink, it sometimes looks purple, depending on if we've decalcified it and removed the calcium from the calcium hydroxy appetite. The reason it's pink is remember, it's made up of collagen type one. That's the, the lattice that, that um, uh, hydroxy appetite builds on, okay? And in mature bone, you have these lamellar structures, these rings, like tree rings, right? The center is the aversion canal where the blood supply comes. And um, out from that, you have the, these ring-like shapes. When you see these rings, you know that it's bone and you know that it's probably mature bone. These little tiny holes here are called lacunae and that's where the osteocytes live. We don't see any osteoblasts or osteoclasts in this picture, but these are where the osteocytes would live. Although um, in this particular case, they kind of have dissolved because of um, the strong decalcifying acid that we use. But a real nice example, I think of mature bone right there. And this is cartilage. Cartilage usually looks blue, although sometimes it can take on a kind of pinkish color to it. Um, the uh, matrix here is full of different types of uh, um, glycosaminoglycans and um, uh, background things that make up the ground substance or the matrix. So the matrix is more loose and blue and it contains a lot of water and that's what gives cartilage its kind of spongy, cushy properties that allow it to uh, be a weight bearing and weight absorbing um, uh, substance. And um, again, there are lacunar spaces, little tiny holes. And in those holes are where the nuclei of the, uh, the chondrocytes uh, live. And so chondrocytes live there in these little spaces. And sometimes they can be clustered together as like little, little family units almost. So if you see blue something with little holes and a little dot in those holes, probably you're dealing with cartilage. And this is normal cartilage from, uh, from an articular surface, by the way, or relatively normal. Now, this is an example of abnormal bone. This is the normal woven, or excuse me, uh, lamellar bone up here. And you can see the osteocytes in their lacunar spaces. These big plump cells lining up along the edge here, those are osteoblasts. And you can see more osteoblasts down here. And look what these osteoblasts are doing. They're building new bone, not normal bone, but this is woven bone. And this is a great example of lamellar bone that's mature with the nice bone lines. And then here, this is made of that same pink collagen material. It's not become uh, mineralized yet. But you can see how haphazard and there's like these little tiny lines of collagen and they're all woven together haphazardly. And so this is new bone. And this is like at a, I think this was near like a site of a, of a degenerated uh, orthopedic implant that had to be replaced. And so there's a lot of reparative changes of the bone. A fracture site would show similar changes. Reactive bone formation around a tumor that had blown out of the cortex would show similar changes. So when I see this, I know something's happened to damage the bone and the osteoblasts are trying to repair that and build new reactive bone. And just as an aside, see this loose, uh, this loose kind of bluish background with these kind of 
triangle shaped or spindled cells here. These guys are myofibroblasts in the background. And myofibroblasts are also part of the repair process in soft tissue. When you get repair, um, the, uh, when the tissue's damaged, you get the beginnings of granulation tissue, and that eventually turns into scar. And granulation tissue is composed of reactive myofibroblasts and reactive proliferative blood vessels, and usually a little bit of inflammation as well. So we get all that in one picture right here. And here's just a closer look so you can really see the lamellar shape of that bone and the woven, uh, woven pattern of this bone. And to me, I regard woven bone as always pathologic. Not always malignant, but it's not normal for the body to make woven bone except in a pathologic state where there's a, a need to repair the bone. All right, now this is a bone lesion. Patient has a, a multiple lytic bone lesions and has a history of a lung mass. So this is metastatic carcinoma in a bone. You don't actually see any bone in this particular picture here. The, the bone's been wiped out by the tumor. But um, metastases, even though in my job I focus a lot on sarcomas and, and bone and soft tissue neoplasia, the most common thing you're going to see that's malignant in bone is going to be metastasis and also maybe multiple myeloma, right? Those are much more common than primary bone malignancies. So it's always important to think of a metastatic cause when you have a bone lesion that has malignant features. And obviously in bone pathology and to some degree in soft tissue pathology, radiology is enormously important. In, in soft tissue, a lot of times we can figure stuff out even without radiology, although radiology can be very helpful if a good musculoskeletal radiologist is interpreting the um, studies or a good orthopedic oncologist. But in bone, I would say that radiology is actually essential. If you don't have radiology, you're going to be liable to make a really huge mistake uh, because things can look similar that once you see the radiographs, you're like, whoa, no way could it possibly be a 10 centimeter osteoid osteoma. Ah, uh -uh, that's right out. Okay, so in any case, this is an example of metastatic carcinoma. Now, there's a whole bunch of different types of carcinoma from all the different organs of the body. Some of them like to go to bone, some don't. You guys know a lot about this. Um, so the thing about carcinomas is that the cells of a carcinoma usually have round or oval nuclei. So carcinomas are made of epithelial cells. Epithelial cells line the surface of the body, the skin on the outside, the inside of the GI tract, the inside of the lungs, and all of the different visceral organs that arise out of those um, internal tubes that are lined by epithelium. Epithelial cells like to stick together because their job is to be a barrier between the inside of the body and the outside world and to stop water and microbes and other things from coming across. The reason I tell you all that basic science stuff, not just because I'm a nerd, but also because that means that when tumors come from epithelial cells, they like to stick together. And you can see all the tumor cells here, they cling together in a nest. So they're either these round or oblong or irregular shaped structures, but the cells clump together like that and that is different from the way most mesenchymal tumors, like bone and soft tissue primary tumors, usually don't grow like that. They kind of grow in diffuse sheets a lot of times. There are some exceptions. So when you see cells that are forming clumps or clusters or nests, and if you see that the shape of the nuclei, the purple part of the cell, is round or oval, those are features of epithelial cells. And if you see something like that in the bone, it's almost always going to be metastatic carcinoma. Probably the one main exception that would be for that is adamantinoma or osteofibrous dysplasia, which are kind of probably two entities that live on a spectrum. And those occur almost exclusively with the rarest of exceptions in the diaphysis of the tibia and occasionally the fibula. They have nests of epithelial cells in the bone, but it's not metastatic carcinoma. How and why that happens still blows my mind. It doesn't make any sense to me embryologically but it happens, and sometimes uh, tumors don't read books. So when you see nests of brown cells, and oh yeah, epithelial cells often have a lot of cytoplasm, often kind of a pinkish color. See all this extra pink around the purple nucleus? That's cytoplasm. So these are um, islands of, um, of carcinoma that are metastatic, and probably right here there's a little hole in the middle. That's probably a gland. So if I recall, this was an adenocarcinoma uh, that we think was from the lung. And this is an immunostain. Notice that the colors change. On this stain right here, this is the hematoxylin and eosin stain, H and E. This is a stain that pathologists have been using since the late 1800s to look at stuff under the microscope and recognize what's going on in tissue. And with a few tweaks, we're still using that same stain over 100 years later, and it works really, really, really well. It's a, the cheapest thing uh, that you can do as far as a test 
is looking at a biopsy on H&E with an experienced pathologist. That makes up for more than all the special tests in the world. Of course, sometimes we have to use stains and molecular tests to help us out in difficult cases. So this case, no problem to tell it's a carcinoma, but sometimes we use different stains to help us tell where that carcinoma might be from if it's not clear on imaging. So this stain right here is an immunostain. Immunostain is what we use. It's kind of like if you remember back to ELISA testing. ELISA testing, you have a little plate and you have an antibody that tags an antigen on the plate. And then you have a second antibody that tags that first one and it's got a little color on it. Well, that's what we do only on tissue. So this is a cytokeratin antibody. And cytokeratin is an immunostain that will stain pretty much all epithelial cells, both benign ones and malignant ones, with rare exceptions. There's rare exceptions to everything. I should just stop saying it. Um, but in any case, what you can see here is the nuclei are negative and the cytoplasm is totally brown. And that's because cytokeratin are intermediate filaments that fill the cytoplasm of epithelial cells. So they're not in the nucleus. And so you don't need to know what all these immunostains look like, but I know sometimes immunostains will come up on pathology reports and you'll be like, what in the world were they with all this alphabet soup stuff? And so uh, when you see that, it's sometimes helpful to have a basic idea that this is what we do. We just take an extra slice from the tissue block, and instead of doing H&E on it, we apply these antibodies, and then we put a light blue background stain so we can kind of see the background uh, tissue. So this is an example of keratin, which would be a good stain for metastatic carcinoma. Oh, and somewhere in here, there's supposed to... Oh, I can get... Never mind. I'll come to that later. Here's another example of metastatic carcinoma. Again, round nuclei, a bunch of cytoplasm. They're kind of grouped in clusters. You can see the bone here, and this is woven bone. This is reactive bone that's being destroyed and, and trying to rebuild around this metastatic tumor. This particular case was metastatic prostate carcinoma. And it would be hard to tell that just on this image here, uh, but that's what it is. One thing about prostate carcinoma people like to talk about is these, the central dot in the middle of the nucleus. Those are nucleoli. Prostate cancer tends to have really big central nucleoli. Uh, other tumors can too, melanomas particularly, but you know anything can have a nucleus or most things. So that's not a specific feature by itself, but it's some things that are clues for pathologists. But of course, in real world, we would use a stain like PSA or, or PSAP or a variety of others to help us uh, determine that it was prostate cancer. And there are newer markers too. Now this is a less common thing, and this is a different stain. This is, um, I think this is a, a Masson's trichrome, if I recall. It's from a really old study set, but this is bone down here. You can see the haversian canals and the lamellar lines, and the bone's just being totally eroded and eaten away. And right here we have islands of tumor cells, but these tumor cells are making pink stuff in the middle. This is loose keratin debris. So these are, if you think back to med school in derm path, you might've learned something about uh, keratin pearls. These are keratin pearls. And the type of carcinoma that makes keratin pearls is squamous cell carcinoma. So a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma would look just like this. Uh, I'm kind of cheating here. This case actually was a really big squamous cell carcinoma from the skin that eroded all the way down into the bone. But a metastatic carcinoma, a squamous cell would look just like this. So just giving you some examples because I've heard that the metastasis is one of the most important things for you guys to know from pathology side. So, and here's another look at a squamous cell carcinoma, a little less dramatic, but they've got really bright pink cytoplasm. And here's tumor island here. Here's tumor, tumor, tumor. And then what's all this background stuff? Well, this is a mixture of inflammation and also sometimes there'll be bone marrow elements too, uh, depending on what bone's involved. But these little round guys are lymphocytes. There's some plasma cells in here. So not all the cells you're gonna see on a biopsy are gonna be tumor. There's usually a lot of background reactive change anytime you have metastatic tumor. Here's another example of carcinoma. And in this one, the nest you can see, but in the middle of the nest, there's an empty space. And this is a gland forming carcinoma, carcinoma that's making open gland spaces. Carcinomas like this often come from one of the visceral organs like the GI tract or the pancreas, um, or the, some parts of the gynecologic tract. And um, carcinomas that make glands are called adenocarcinomas. And there's a ton of different types of adenocarcinoma from all these different organs. And then that's when we use immunostains sometimes to help us decide is this from the, the pancreas or from the uterus or somewhere else. And then finally, this is an example of metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Renal cell carcinomas usually have a bunch of very pale, clear cytoplasm. Okay, so the, the clear cytoplasm here 
around the outside of these nuclei. That's a typical feature of renal cell. And you can kind of vaguely see that they're in nests, but admittedly, that it's kind of hard to tell that in this picture unless you're a pathologist. And look at this right here in the middle, big blood vessel. So renal cell carcinoma, both in the kidney and when it metastasizes, likes to grow big clear cells with large blood vessels in between. And a lot of times, uh, renal cell carcinoma metastases are very hemorrhagic. They bleed a lot and hemorrhage. And that's why, because they have this really rich vascular network. Here's another example with really prominent pale, clear to pale pink cytoplasm. So that clear change with the sharp cell outlines here uh, is pretty good. And if you're watching this online later, I'll put some links down in the video description of uh, videos that I think might be particularly useful for orthopedic surgery residents or med students who are trying to learn the, the basics of bone and soft tissue pathology. Now, this is a, a pretty dramatic example. Anyone want to take a stab at what this might be? This is the gross photo, obviously. Yeah, this is an osteosarcoma. And unfortunately, this patient uh, had an amputation uh, for this. The tumor is growing from the medullary space, blowing through the cortex and expanding out dramatically in the soft tissue. And see the white here up at the very top? Those little white lacy things, that's osteoid. That's mineralized osteoid extending out in the soft tissue. And that's exactly what you're going to see on imaging, right? You might see lifting of the, the periosteum, the Codman's triangle. But also when you see a large mass with white, you know, fluffy kind of uh, calcification in it, extending out of the bone, that's the hallmark of what we expect on imaging to see in an osteosarcoma. So this is a really dramatic example of that, and an unfortunate patient that um, had to have an amputation for it. And here's a different case, and this is from a skeletally immature patient. And here you can see this is the pre-existing bone, the cortex, and then here's the medulla. And this is a really, really cool type of slide that you rarely see. Now these are whole mount slides, which were, this was done in a research lab and kindly shared with me by one of my uh, uh, mentors, Dr. Aubrey Huff, uh, from his collection. And so this was actually two different whole mount slides that I put together, but they took the entire end of the bone and uh, they cut it in two and then mounted it. And instead of making a little glass slide like we normally have, they made an enormous glass slide, um, two of them. And so I just uh, scanned them with a scanner and then cropped them together here. But it's a really great example of you can see the cortex, but you can see the whole medullary space is replaced by tumor and these little strands of pink stuff, these little little squiggly lines of pink, that's osteoid. That's new osteoid being created by the tumor. You can see the same thing perforating through the cortex and expanding outward into the soft tissue in this kind of radial like starburst sort of uh, fashion. So our sunburst, so this is the kind of sunburst pattern of radial lines of osteoid being pushed out and growing out of the tumor. And then here you can see how the periosteum is being lifted up by this growing, expanding tumor. You can tell that this is a child, a skeletally immature individual, because look at this right here in the bottom left, that little line of uh, blue stuff, that's cartilage, that's the growth plate. So it's an unfused growth plate. So this was from a child. And you can see most of the tumor is in the metaphysis and extending into the diaphysis, but there is a little bit in this case that's perforated through the growth plate and gotten into the epiphysis. The articular cartilage though is not involved and that's on the far left there. And here's a closer look just showing you that Codman's triangle area, right? So this is, and it's not clear because again, this is a scan done with like a, a flatbed scanner, not with um, a whole slide imager. I don't know of anyone who can yet who can scan these big slides, but I'm gonna try um, to get them scanned at high magnification once I can find a way to do that. So pretty rare. You're, you're probably never going to see a specimen like that again. It's very few people that are able to make specimens like this. It's really impressive. Here's a radiograph, not from inside the patient, but uh, of the actual uh, removed piece of bone. And you can see the, the elevation of the periosteum, the Codman's triangle, those uh, sunburst pattern of, of radial kind of lines of osteoid, and the osteoid mineral matrix extending out of the bone into the soft tissue, the, the hallmark features of osteosarcoma. And again, you can see growth plate over here. Pretty, pretty impressive and dramatic specimen. So microscopically, what you want to see in osteosarcoma is malignant spindle cells or malignant cells of whatever type creating and laying down new osteoid. That is the, the one sentence uh, of what we're looking for microscopically in osteosarcoma. Malignant cells making osteoid. So these purpley things in the background here, bluish purple, are, um, are the, the malignant cells. 
and these little strands of pink stuff, that's the new osteoid. And as the osteoid grows, it picks up calcium and becomes purple. If you decalcify it a lot, that purple can kind of dissolve away and just leave you with the pink osteoid. But in, um, in osteosarc, a lot of times the purple kind of builds up. And even when we decalcify it, you can usually find a little bit of it left. Um, and that's a really helpful feature. Here's a closer look. These are ugly, atypical um, cells, the, the bluish uh, purple cells here. And they are present right next to these strands of pink osteoid. And remember, osteoid's type 1 collagen. So it's collagen that's getting laid down in these squiggly, lacy lines and then beginning to pick up purple and mineralize into calcium hydroxyapatite. So that right there, that's classic osteosarcoma microscopically. And there are different variants of osteosarc, chondroblastic and other stuff, but we're not going to go into that now. Now, switching gears, here's a different type of tumor. Anyone want to take a stab at what this might be grossly? Hard to tell, right? Because you guys usually take it out and don't slice it open. Thank you for that, by the way. We like to handle the slicing ourselves in the lab. This is a rib right here in the bottom left. And this tumor is blown out of the rib. It's a huge tumor. And this glistening kind of gelatinous lobulated look, this is chondrosarcoma. And there's some, some bloody hemorrhage in the middle of it. But these jelly-looking uh, jelly translucent lobules over on the far right, that's, that's classically what we're going to see in a chondrosarcoma. And it can look a little different depending on whether you've cut it fresh or whether the section you're looking at has been soaking in formalin for a while. So that can alter the appearance somewhat. What we want to see with chondrosarcoma microscopically, ideally, is tumor that uh, cartilage that is growing in between and completely surrounding trabecular bone. And so you can see little islands of bone trabeculae here, and they are completely encased in this blue, gooey-looking chondrosarcoma. And it, when we uh, have obvious cytologic atypia, like atypical nuclei and kind of increased cellularity, when we see that, we know that it's probably at least a grade 2 chondrosarcoma. So grade 2 chondrosarcomas are pretty easy to diagnose, even on a partial biopsy. Grade 1 chondrosarcomas are extremely difficult to diagnose, in my opinion, because they can look almost identical to enchondroma. The best way to tell them apart is to see encasement and entrapment of trabecular bone. But unfortunately, when a curatage is done, which is a reasonable thing to do, of course, for a low-grade cartilage tumor, but it takes away our ability to see this. So oftentimes, I am unable to make a definite diagnosis of grade 1 chondrosarcoma versus enchondroma. So the main job we have when, if you're biopsying a cartilage tumor, and usually on imaging, you're going to be able to easily tell that you're dealing with a cartilage tumor. Um, the main thing I can do is say, yes, it's cartilage, and no, there's nothing that looks like obvious atypical stuff. Um, there are some very subtle ways that people try to tell apart enchondroma and grade one chondrosarcoma. I still, after eight years of practice and doing a fellowship, I find it extremely challenging. Um, the biggest things that help me are the, the clinical features and the radiographic features. That's the, the main thing that helps point between the two. And in fact, you know, low grade, what we call grade one chondrosarcoma in the extremities has a very good prognosis, right? It may come back, but by itself, it does not have metastatic potential. Although rare cases can progress and de-differentiate and become high grade, that's pretty uncommon. So the behavior is so good that the new... Um, uh, World Health Organization Bone and Soft Tissue Tumor book, which is kind of like the, the gold standard of diagnostic terminology that we use in, in bone and soft tissue pathology. The new edition just came out this year, and they've actually decided to reclassify or rename uh, when we see a, a grade one chondrosarc, when it's in the extremities, in the, um, the appendicular skeleton, the new name is actually going to be atypical cartilaginous neoplasm um, and because it behaves so well. So the idea is kind of like how, but if it's in the, the axial skeleton, um, in, because of the difficulties of those surgical sites, the, it, it will be called grade one chondrosarcoma. So this is a very new thing, and I'm still not totally used to the terminology, but I kind of like their point, even though it's a, a bit confusing to rename things. The idea is kind of akin to how in the retroperitoneum, we call things well-differentiated liposarcoma. If you put that exact same tumor in the thigh, we change its name and call it atypical lipomatous tumor. It's confusing, and especially, I think, to non-pathologists, but it's because it behaves so much better in that location. So this is a great example of infiltrative growth and entrapment of bone trabecula, or trabeculae in, um, in a chondrosarcoma, and I think this is a grade two by the look of it from here. This is obviously a chondrosarcoma here because it's way too cellular. It's 
not you saw what normal cartilage looked like. There's a lot more cells here. There's kind of mixoid breakdown where the, the tissue gets real loose and like kind of falls apart and as bluish white. Um, and that's a feature, those are features that are uh, commonly seen in chondrocercomas. And there's just a closer look. It's a little hard because uh, this is not the clearest picture, but to see that the cells, you can't really tell that they're sitting in lacunar spaces in this area. Over here, you kind of can see there's little holes that they're sitting in. And um, here's an example of like a lower grade uh, chondrosarcoma that really doesn't, I mean, the cells are a little enlarged, but they're not super atypical. They do have open spaces. See the lacunar spaces that they're sitting in? And there's a little bit of this stuff that's starting to break down and look mixoid. All right. Next uh, entity. You guys know what this is right away. And because of that, we don't often see them on pathology unless they're problematic or symptomatic clinically, right? So this mushroom-shaped polypoid lesion is, of course, an osteochondroma. And this is like the most awesome example of one you could want, right? And they kind of are plucked out of the cortex here. And you can see that there's a cortical, uh, the cortex is absent uh, underneath the stalk. There's continuity between the marrow space and the middle of the stalk of the lesion. And there's going to be a cartilage cap on the surface. Usually, in um, some cases, that cartilage can be almost entirely absent, actually. And in other cases, it can be kind of thick. And when it gets too thick, we get a little worried that it could be turning into chondrosarcoma. Um, and we use little measurements of saying, well, if it's more than I can't remember what the cutoff is. But usually if it's turning into chondrosarcoma, it's usually going to be massive expansion of cartilage off the surface. So that's a good example of osteochondroma. And here's another one of those large whole mount slides from, from the olden days. Um, and this one was not as much like on a stalk, but kind of more sessile. But you can see cortex over here, and then the cortex disappears, and you have this continuity between the middle of the osteochondroma and the marrow space of the underlying bone. And on the surface is the cartilage cap. And this is a this is stained with Masson's trichrome stain, um, which we don't usually use uh, for bone, or I don't usually use, but it's quite beautiful, actually. Um, and so this is just a good low power example to help you see the configuration, because normally we can't get all of that on one slide. This is what I'm looking for, though, on H&E. The classic examples, the best examples look like this. A lot of them don't look this good, but I wanted to show you guys the good stuff. What you can see up here is the cartilage cap, okay? This cartilage is kind of cellular compared to what I showed you earlier, but look at what's happening. The chondrocytes are in these kind of elongated clusters, like columns. So these columns right here are going down, and then what's happening underneath? The cartilage is turning into bone, little uh, trabeculae of bone. And this is basically recapitulating what happens at the growth plate during endochondral ossification in, in uh, kids as their bones are growing. And so this is a really cool example that basically if you look at a growth plate, it looks a lot like this, that the chondrocytes are stacked up like that. So this is a, a real nice example of osteochondroma. And sometimes you can get reactive fracture changes and stuff in the stalk, and they can get kind of busy and weird looking. And there's just a closer look. Isn't that beautiful? If you don't like that, I don't know how to help you guys, okay? Like that is the most beautiful thing ever. It got like 100 likes on Twitter, so I know some people out there like it. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I do uh, post stuff on, on, oh, I don't remember I mentioned, yeah, I, said, I think I did. I have a YouTube channel with a bunch of stuff on it, some of which is relevant to you guys. And I also use Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff. So if you're vaguely interested in pathology um, or want to daydream the next time you're on call and wishing that you were home in your bed, go and check out my, uh, my social media stuff. And remember, it's not too late to switch. Just saying. I'm just kidding. Right. Hey, I love it. It's the best job in the world for me. That's what someone told me. If you like being a pathologist, it's the best job in the world. And luckily for me, I liked it. So, All right. So here's an example of what used to be an osteochondroma, but now has a massive overgrowth of cartilage on the surface. So this is secondary peripheral chondrosarcoma. Chondrosarcoma arising from the surface of an osteosarcoma. And so this is a risk that happens... Um, in some, a uh, small number of osteochondromas can do this. And particularly, we worry about this in people that have uh, multiple hereditary osteochondromatosis or multiple hereditary exostosis, whichever name you like. Um, they have multiple osteochondromas and do have a higher risk of developing a chondrosarcoma. It's a pretty dramatic one. All right, next tumor. So what is, what is uh, this? Does anyone know? Small round blue cell, good. If you can get to that, that's good enough because once once I get to that, 
there's really the next step is I have to do immunostains and molecular or look at the clinical situation because small round blue cell tumors do have some subtle differences between them, but pretty much most of them can have areas that look very, very similar to each other. Okay. So this of course is Ewing sarcoma because we're doing a basic bone pathology lecture and the cells have very uniform round blue nuclei. See how all the nuclei look really pretty much alike. Some places they look a little darker just based on the way they're cut, but they, you don't have really huge mass of ugly cells and then smaller cells. They all look the same. This is very typical of translocation sarcomas because they have the same exact molecular abnormality um, in the cells with you know, e Ewing's gene with fly one or whatever it is. All the cells have the same molecular abnormality, so all the cells look kind of the same. That's a general rule. And it works pretty well for, for most of the translocation sarcomas. Usually they don't have ugly pleomorphism. They just have uniform cells throughout. And um, Ewing's often has a real pale or clear cytoplasm because they have a bunch of glycogen um, sugar stored in the background. And when we process the tissue, that kind of melts and washes away. And that leaves us with this kind of empty space here. Okay. So Ewing sarcoma is the classic small round blue cell thing you need to know. And right here is an example of the buzzword immunostain, CD99, which should have strong, diffuse membrane staining. See how it's like a little circle around each cell? That's the classic pattern of CD99 staining that we want to see in a Ewing sarcoma. But I will point out, in real life, CD99 stains a whole bunch of things. In fact, my mentor, Sharon Weiss, who's like one of the gurus of uh, soft tissue pathology, she said CD99 is a, is a marker of small round blueness. Basically, if it's a small round blue cell, a good chance is it'll stain with CD99. It's not always true, but so it's a very sensitive marker, but not specific. So if it's negative, that is a strong argument against Ewing's. But positive definitely doesn't prove Ewing's, not to me at least. I pretty much always want to have molecular confirmation if possible for Ewing sarcoma. The reason is the other round blue cell tumors, like say ALL, you know, lymphoblastic lymphoma, or what they've renamed it recently. I can't remember the new name. It's longer and more confusing. So if you think of renaming tumors in soft tissue pathology is bad, just check out hematopathology. Those guys are constantly renaming stuff. And I love them and I'm friends with them, but it is complicated. So the, the point is, is that like ALL can stain with CD99 and be in bone and be around blue cell tumor and in a kid, but the treatment is totally different, right? So this is one of those times that being right is really, really important. Sometimes the distinction between different subtypes of sarcoma is kind of academic, right? Particularly like in adult pleomorphic soft tissue sarcomas. They may have differences in prognosis, but the treatment is usually very similar, if not the same. But we don't have real targeted therapies um, medically. But round blue cell tumors and a lot of pediatric sarcomas are not that way. They have specific protocols, and so sorting them out is really important. So if you're in practice and you're dealing with this, these are times where you need to be able to talk to your pathologist and make sure your pathologist um, is comfortable with the case, that they know how to handle the case, that they understand the relevance of what the diagnosis is going to do for the patient. So that's why I love being able to talk to the orthopedic oncologists and ask them, what are you going to do when I say this or that diagnosis? If they're like, oh, I'm going to take it out anyway, well, then I don't lose as much sleep over that. If they're like, oh, this is going to be a major difference, those are the times I do molecular or I send it out for another expert consultation or something like that. I still send cases out from time to time to my mentors and other, other experts just to get an extra look at really difficult cases to make sure I'm not missing something. So talk to your pathologist. Most of us are relatively nice folks who like to talk to other people. We don't just like hang out and do autopsies in the basement, okay? I haven't done an autopsy in over a decade. So in any case, don't be afraid of us. We're here to help. Here is a list, and I will, I will send this to you, okay? This is a list of some common immunostains. I did this for a, a skin a module that I was teaching um, at, at my former med school. And so some of this is not totally relevant to bone, but a lot of these are things that will come up in pathology reports. And I wanted to give you a, a basic list. I probably should expand this and add some more markers to it to make it more relevant for soft tissue. I'll try to do that at some point. And if you're watching this online, just click down in the video description and I'll put a link to, to so you can download this table uh, for studying. But I tried to aim this at medical students or, or residents, you know, beginner level, so that when you see Desmond, you know, oh, they're talking about a muscle stain. Okay, or keratin is talking about a carcinoma or an epithelial cell. Because I know that stuff is alphabet soup, and it was for me as a pathology resident even for the first couple of years. It took a while to really grasp it, and there's still new stains all the time. So here's another one of those whole mount slides blown up big. You can see again, this is a, as a child. Here's the growth plate. The growth plate is kind of mangled in the middle here because here's a tumor that's growing, and it's purple because there's some calcification in it. 
it's in the epiphysis, right? Most of it is up here above the growth plate. So it's in the epiphysis of the bone. And you know that when there's a lytic lesion, I assume this is lytic on x-ray, I don't have an x-ray on this one, that, you know, in the epiphysis, there's only a few options we really think of commonly, right? And here's what this one is. So what is this uh, the classic picture of? You guys are like classic, yeah, right. Well, look at this purple stuff. If I tell you it's chicken wire calcification, then you'll know what it is, right? Yeah, this is chondroblastoma. So what they, I don't like the use of chicken wire anywhere in pathology, but people just love using it. I'm a very concrete thinker. Um, I don't have good abstract thought. At least that's what my wife says, and she's a psychiatrist, so I, she's probably right. But I think chicken wire should be like perfect repeating hexagons, man. None of, that's not what this looks like. But what this is is little tiny wiry purple strands that are wrapping around individual tumor cells, okay? And the individual tumor cells like this one here on the left, I'll show you a closer look. They have kind of a bean shape, okay? So this is what um, chondroblastoma is supposed to do. These bean shaped cells, lytic epiphyseal mass in a kid, and is ideally, if you're lucky, will be surrounded by these, these chicken wire kind of net-like calcification. Here's a closer look and you can kind of see the nuclei here. I tried to blow it up, it's kind of blurry, I apologize, but see how it's got like a little kidney bean look, a coffee bean look. And what's the other tumor that can occur in bone that classically has a bean-shaped nucleus? Langerhans cell, histiocytosis, okay? Langerhans cells look a lot like this, actually. The, they are gonna usually not have that chicken wire calcification, they're kind of be in diffuse sheets, and they usually have a ton of eosinophils um, in the background with them. And I meant to put in a picture of Langerhans, and I forgot, and I'm sorry for that. But Langerhans histiocytosis is an important thing to know because obviously that can form, you know, a lytic lesion in bone. Also, I see in my other my other hat is um, outside of bone and soft tissue is to be a dermatopathologist, and we see Langerhans histiocytosis in skin as well in, in young kids. So, so it's an important disease to be aware of. All right, here's another kind of lytic, kind of multi-loculated lytic lesion here that looks to be in the kind of the epiphysis and metaphysis here and it's expanding and pushing out um, the cortex and then on pathology what we see is sheets of multinucleated giant cells right now in the real world giant cells are present in like all sorts of bone tumors basically anytime there's a lesion that's causing some damage to the bone there's going to be giant cells as bone breaks down new bone starts to get built and osteoclasts home right into that because they want to be part of the remodeling process okay so that is just because there's a giant cell doesn't mean something's giant cell tumor this is what i want to see i want to see lots of giant cells I've got a diffuse a sea of giant cells sometimes they're even more closely packed than this and then in between the giant cells are these kind of mononuclear cells that don't have any real specific look they're either kind of round or oval shaped and people say the nuclei of these cells in here look like the nuclei of the giant cells. I guess. it's. I always felt that was kind of a stretch. But they say these nuclei, these are the mononuclear cells that are in between the giant cells. That these nuclei are kind of the same as these. I like to think they're about the same size as those. It's the individual nuclei in the giant cells are about the same size as the background nuclei. That's fair. The nuclei in the, um, I'm sorry, the giant cells in giant cell tumor of bone have numerous nuclei, like a hundred nuclei or something. Okay, they're usually really big and have a bunch of nuclei. So that is, uh, that's the classic finding in giant cell tumor. Sometimes giant cell tumors can have secondary aneurysmal change and aneurysmal bone cysts often have giant cell rich areas. So occasionally it can be really hard, especially on a partial biopsy for us as pathologists to tell apart giant cell tumor bone and aneurysmal bone cysts. Um, and so that's times where the radiology can really help. And also having a, a good size of a sample can potentially help us see areas that look definitive for giant cell tumor um, or, or, or aneurysmal bone cysts. So that can be helpful. All right, here's a different disease here. Here, these cells have round nuclei, but they're not making nests at all, right? They're just kind of a diffuse sheet. They're all just kind of floating around there. Round nuclei of cells that are kind of in a sheet that don't seem to be like really hugging their neighbors, that's often when we see that as a pathologist, that we say that these cells are discohesive. They look like they're individual floating cells that are not really um, clinging to their neighbor or making nests. The type of cells that are often discohesive that we see are hematolymphoid neoplasms. So um, lymphoma, myeloma, and then occasionally the other round blue cell tumors and some other things can do that too. But I always, whenever I see round nuclei and kind of free floating, evenly distributed cells, I always want to rule out lymphoma or leukemia or myeloma. And it's a really important difference too, because the way you guys are going to treat one of those hematolymphoid neoplasms 
is extremely different from the way you're going to treat a sarcoma, right? So to me, if I miss a lymphoma or a myeloma bone, that is a, that is a huge miss, right? That is a big, big mistake that's going to hurt somebody and going to cause a big problem. So I always want to make sure I have um, my mind on that to not, to not mistake those things. So when you blow these cells up, you can see that some of them have a lot of cytoplasm, like this one here. And look at the nucleus. It's like kind of pushed out to the edge. It's eccentric. Instead of in the middle, it's at the edge. It's got a big blob of pink cytoplasm here. And then the nucleus is pushed all the way out. And there's this little pale space right next to the nucleus. The same thing's kind of happening here. There's a pale space, but this one has like two nuclei. It's binucleated, like two eyeballs looking at you. So these are the, that's kind of reminiscent of what we see in plasma cells. And that's what these are. These are malignant plasma cells. So they look kind of weird and atypical, but the eccentric nucleus and the perinuclear Hoff, um, which is a prominent Golgi apparatus that's made for transporting um, immunoglobulins out of the cell for release into the circulation. That's what its role is in the normal plasma cell. But these are, these are malignant clonal plasma cells. And... Here is, um, this, is a, this is a special type of stain we do called in situ hybridization. It's not actually an antibody, it's actually an RNA probe that probes for kappa and for lambda light chain. And normally any plasma cell population that's normal, reactive, is gonna have a mixture of kappa and lambda mixed together. And here, this is completely solidly positive for kappa and lambda was totally pink, just totally negative. So they're, they're clonal and so this is a myeloma involving a bone. All right, so, okay, um, this is an example of pleomorphism. I've, I've mentioned pleomorphism, but I didn't really show you a good example. These atypical tumor cells are pretty big already. Like these guys are big and ugly, but then look at this one. It's like 25 times, it's like a chocolate chip cookie that, you know, like a kid made or something. It's like so irregular. All these things inside it are nucleoli. It has like 25 nucleoli. That is bizarre and crazy. That is nowhere near normal. So when we see the way we define pleomorphism is one tumor cell that's at least four times bigger than one of its neighboring tumor cells. So here's a tumor cell. And then this guy in the middle ate like 35 of those guys for breakfast. So that's pleomorphism. So this is a classic example of a lot of different sarcomas in particularly in adults could look like this. So in soft tissue, we're gonna switch gears to soft tissue briefly and cover a couple of entities. Soft tissue sarcomas that have ugly pleomorphic nuclei, mitoses and necrosis. The, the options, the big options are undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, which is what the, the entity that used to many, many years ago be referred to as malignant fibrous histiocytoma, MFH. I hope that you guys know now that that name is totally obsolete. If you ever see it in books or tests, that's an old, old book or test because that name's been obsolete for coming up on 20 years now um, that we're not supposed to use that name. So we call those undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, but other things can look like this too. Pleomorphic leiomyosarcoma, pleomorphic rhabdomyosarcoma, which does occur in adults actually. Um, and um, uh, pleomorphic liposarcomas, dedifferentiated liposarcomas, is a whole variety of things. So we use a couple of different things to help us sort out what those are. But again, the difference is, there are differences in prognosis, but the treatment is you're gonna to try to get wide local excision to get negative margins. You're usually gonna use radiation therapy to help with margin control. And then discussion of maybe chemotherapy, although we don't have really great effective agents, unfortunately. Um, I'm not a medical oncologist, but my understanding is we give chemo, especially when patients get METs sometimes, but a lot of times these tumors don't respond terribly well to chemo, unfortunately. So this is an example of UPS right here. Now this cell right here is a big, ugly pleomorphic cell, but it's got these big white bubbles. It's got small bubbles, big bubbles. They're pushing in on the nucleus. These are lipid bubbles. So when we see an atypical cell that has these white clear bubbles of lipid in them, that's a lipoblast. This is a pleomorphic lipoblast. And this is the hallmark cell that we look for to diagnose pleomorphic liposarcoma. If you take the lipoblasts away, all that you're left with is ugly pleomorphic cells that don't look like anything. And so that would be UPS. So UPS, if, that's why if someone gets a biopsy and calls something UPS, and then on the excision, they find a lipoblast, the diagnosis will now change to pleomorphic liposarcoma. That doesn't mean the pathologist made a mistake on the needle. It just means that there wasn't a lipoblast. Sometimes they can be very rare. Sometimes they're numerous. It really ranges. Pleomorphic liposarcomas have a wide range of features. Okay. So that's a pleomorphic lipoblast, and it's, it can be present in some of the other types of liposarcoma, but it must be present in pleomorphic liposarcoma. And these are more aggressive than UPS, five-year survival about 50%. They're pretty aggressive, nasty tumors, and they usually arise in the deep soft tissue of the extremities. All right, 
Now this is also a liposarcoma, but it looks totally different. It's got these tiny little oval round cells that all look just like each other, not atypical at all. They're, space, they're doing good social distancing. They're kind of spread out from their neighbors. There's this pale blue stuff in the background. This is mixoid material. Mixoid is like hyaluronic acid and glycosaminoglycan ground substance. That stuff that you learned way back in first year biochem in med school. Um, I actually do use some of that stuff in my practice. And then we've got these branching so-called chicken wire vessels. And as I told you, I don't like that. But they're kind of these very delicate, tiny branching blood vessels, mixoid background and small bland that means not atypical nuclei. This is mixoid liposarcoma. So I will point out that all liposarcomas can potentially have mixoid change. So just because there's mixoid change in a fatty tumor does not make it a mixoid liposarcoma. These are special tumors. They behave differently and can respond differently to therapy. They're often chemo and radiation sensitive, um, and they, uh, they are translocation sarcomas. They have a translocation. And you can go look up the translocations later if you need to know those, I'm not sure how much of those you need to know. But I figured this is the stuff that most people struggle with the most. What are the blue and pink dots? So I figured I'd focus on that and let you go look up tables of fusions. And the lipoblasts in mixoid liposarcoma are these little tiny guys that look like a little ring, like a little signet ring with, you know, a little gemstone on the top. And this is basically, this tumor is recapitulating fetal um, fat development. This is kind of the stages of what we see in, in embryonic and fetal fat development. And mixoid liposarcoma is going back and, and doing that. Liposarcomas almost never occur in kids, but when they do, this is the type that kids get, usually. And um, the, uh, there is another tumor that's benign that's called lipoblastoma, and it can look almost identical to this. So if you ever hear a diagnosis on one of your patients who's a child of mixoid liposarcoma, make sure the pathologist has done molecular to confirm that it's truly mixoid liposarcoma. Because even really good pathologists can have trouble telling apart lipoblastoma, which is totally benign, from mixoid liposarcoma in children. So it's rare. I've only diagnosed mixed liposarcoma in a kid once or twice, maybe, but I, I sent for molecular for sure. I wanted to confirm it. All right. That's just a practical pearl for you for practice. Here's an example of well-differentiated liposarcoma, aka a typical lipomatous tumor when it's in the extremities or the superficial soft tissues. It has mature fat cells. These big white cells are mature fat of varying size, usually small ones, medium ones, big ones. And then oftentimes it has these pink fibrous bands of collagen running through it. And when you see a big one of these on imaging, you can often see that it's a fatty tumor, but it has these strands of fibrosis going through it. Now, benign things like lipomas can do that too. You can have big lipomas with fibrous bands, but the more of that I see, the more careful I want to be to rule out a well diff liposarcoma. And in fact, as a general rule, if something looks just like a lipoma and has no atypia, but it's bigger than 10 centimeters, I'll usually do fish for MDM2, which is a gene that's amplified in well diff liposarc, atypical lipomatous tumor, because um, you can have, um, rarely you can have atypical lipomatous tumor, well diff liposarc that looks identical to lipoma and has no atypical cells at all. So what we see is the fat cells, the fibrous bands, and then these hyperchromatic atypical spindle cells. Here's a closer look at those, these ugly, really dark bluish purple nuclei that are big and pleomorphic scattered in the middle of the fat and the fibrous bands. So you don't have to find any lipoblasts for this tumor. Um, these are relatively common. I, I don't know how tested they are, but this is among the soft tissue malignancies. This is one of the ones I see most often. So it's, I think, a good thing to know about. And it's really easy. If there's any doubt, fish for MDM2 can solve the problem because it's a very sensitive and specific marker for well-differentiated liposarcoma. Oh, yeah, sometimes you can. Uh, yeah, there are some little bubbles here that are probably little tiny lipoblasts. You're right. Yeah, so they kind of do have that signet ring look. Good good pickup. You sure you don't want to be a pathologist? You could do it. You know, I tell you what, the I have this huge respect for orthopedic oncologists. And in fact, when I took this job, uh, getting to go to dinner with Tom Bowen and his wife, that was really a big help to make me decide that this is the place for me to be because I had such a great relationship with my ortho oncs at um, University of Arkansas. And I really wanted to be able to have that uh, kind of interaction. And so Tom is amazing, obviously. And uh, to work with people like that is great. And I, you know, my senior level um, orthopedic oncologist at Arkansas, uh, Richard Nicholas, great guy. I mean, he would say, oh, is that pleomorphism there? Is this, I think maybe this could be a mix of fibrosarc. And I was like, you can come and cover my service when I'm out of town, man. I mean, he was, he's a pathologist. So, so I love that, that ortho oncs are almost as nerdy about soft tissue pathology as I am. So it's... Respect, man. All right. Tom, you can give me that 50 bucks later if you're listening to this. Okay. So this is another, this is a mass in the elbow of a 30-year-old, okay? 
And look, there's spindle cells here, but there's also these funny kind of nests that have an open center. These are glands, just like you'd see like in an adenocarcinoma. But what the heck, in a 30-year-old, that doesn't make sense. They're glands with background spindle cells. This is biphasic synovial sarcoma. So this is the classic type of synovial sarcoma that was described. Although now we recognize that this is only a small minority of synovial sarcomas actually have the gland pattern. The majority of the ones I see just have the spindle cells and we call those monophasic. So here's a closer look at the biphasic spindle cells. And again, they're very uniform, not pleomorphic because this is a translocation sarcoma. And then here's the, the tumor cells form these funny glands, which we don't know why. And of course, I hope you guys know this, but there is absolutely no relationship between this and synovium. The, a long time ago, because they occur near joints, people thought maybe they had something to do with synovial cells. They do not. They do not arise from synoviocytes, the, the cells that line synovium. They have nothing to do with synovium. And this is what we usually see. This is an example of uniform spindle cells in these long rows. See how they're kind of swimming like a school of fish? They're, they're like, we call those fascicles. A lot of different tumors can make fascicles. Lyomyosarcomas can, and a wide variety of others. But these fascicles are kind of sharply intersecting in this pattern that we call herringbone, like the bones on a fish, how they come up to the spine, or chevron pattern. And it's, I don't know, it reminds me back before you guys were born in the 1990s, there were these things called seeing eye puzzles. And you could like squint your eyes. And if you were one of the few people that were lucky enough, it would like turn three dimensional on you. This is what this reminds me of. I feel like if I squint in my eyes, it like will come out of the screen. Probably that means I've been doing pathology too long. But anyway, this is monophasic synovial sarcoma and a lot other things like malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor can have this pattern, although usually uglier cells and, and others, okay? So, but just so you know, that's monophasic synovial sarcoma. All right, there's, I think we got a couple more minutes. This, anyone want to take a stab at what this bone is? This is the normal, it used to be normal bone and here's the tumor here. This is a, a sample I rarely ever get to see. Maybe this is the only time, I don't know. Nope, a good try. This is a, this is the coccyx. This is the coccyx bone and there's a disc right there. See the intervertebral disc. And then what we have is this big bluish tumor. It's got um, these kind of islands of, of uh, blue stuff divided by fibrous septation. I'll go, give you a closer look. I just thought that's amazing to see the coccyx. So this was a, a coccectomy or partial sacrectomy with coccyx removal, obviously, and because of the tumor growing out of the coccyx. So now that you know what tumor is, it's probably growing out of the coccyx. Cordoma. Very good. Cordoma arises either at the clivus or the sacrum coccyx area, either end of the spine, usually with some rare exceptions. And what we see in cordoma close up is these big plump epithelioid cells. They got a lot of pale cytoplasm, but instead of making nice tight nests, they usually make these kind of elongated rows, cords or chains where they kind of follow each other in these curvy single file lines. And I was just giving a lecture the other day to the residents at McGill University in Canada, and I used this slide, and one of them told me they're attending um, uh, Sungmi Jung, I think. She said that these look like bicycle chain. And I thought, oh, that's so cool because it kind of wraps around and has like little little areas that are kind of knobby that stick out from the rest. So that's what cordoma looks like. It has these cords and chains or bicycle chain appearance. Um, and then also it has this bluish mixoid stuff in the background, that hyaluronic acid type of background. So that is a really classic example of cordoma. And then this is the buzzword cell. These cells that have bubbly, clear bubbles or vacuoles in them, they look very much like lipoblasts actually. These cells right here are, um, are, uh, are called physaliferous cells. It means bubbly cell, basically from Greek. And that's the, the buzzword people like to talk about in cordoma, although you don't actually have to find them to make the diagnosis. And I think this is the last entity I've got in here for you. These are uh, fibroblasts that are all kind of streaming and running in a parallel, that big, big, broad parallel fascicle with a lot of pink collagen in between. Um, unlike the fascicle of synovial sarc, which is very cellular and all the nuclei are together, it looks more blue. This looks more pink because there's more collagen in the background. And here you can see the same fascicles running and these big red things trapped here, those are skeletal muscle fibers. So this is desmoid fibromatosis. It's bland and it's hypocellular, but it's very locally infiltrative and often infiltrates skeletal muscle um, in the adjacent soft tissue. And that's the classic feature of desmoid fibromatosis. And I got a whole video on that if you guys need an update on those. And I think that's the end. I, I got as much as I could packed into one hour. Um, thank you guys for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.